It is indeed a difficult hymn to sing, one that is very appropriate with the scripture reading for today. The lectionary reading for today is taken from Genesis chapter 22. It is probably the most well-known text concerning Abraham, and it is the call for Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Um, as I said, I didn't choose it. It's actually the lectionary reading for the day, a strange choice of reading for the first Sunday after Father's Day of all things. This is a difficult text, friends, and we need prayer. Before we read scripture, let us pray. Once more, in all humility, we come to you, O God, asking for the leading of your spirit. Open our hearts, minds, our ears. May we hear your message this morning in a way that changes our lives. Help us to make sense of these difficult words, knowing that they bring hope to the kind of world that we live in. We I pray these things with anticipation. In the strong name of Jesus the Christ, amen. A reading from Genesis chapter 22. Listen for God's word to you. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God has shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young man, See, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the, word, the wood from the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God has shown him, Abraham built an altar and there, there and laid the wood in order. Then he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven saying, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How do you make sense of such a strange and in places awful passage? Well, let me start with this. I am fascinated by movies, the kind of movie where an older character travels back in time to speak to his younger self, generally with some good advice. You've seen many of them. So there are many indeed. For example, Back to the Future, one loses count of how many times Marty travels back in time to speak to his old self. There's one instance, however, where old Biff speaks to young Biff, gives him an almanac telling him to bet big, and he makes it big. There's the movies with Bruce Willis. For some reason, Bruce Willis always appears in movies where he goes back in time and speaks to his younger self. In the movie Looper, Bruce Willis is a hitman who goes back in time to be killed by his younger self. It sounds weird. The movie's even weirder, I know. There's a movie called The Kid in which Bruce Willis again goes back in time to speak to his younger self and give him some advice. Kevin Costner was in another movie called Frequency, etc., etc., etc. 
These are interesting movies, and you can actually drive trucks through the holes in, the, in their plots. The premise of time travel in movies rarely works, but I do find especially the last two pretty endearing and, and somewhat thought-provoking. As you watch these movies, you ask yourself, if I had the opportunity, would I go back in time and give advice to my younger self? And if I did, what would I tell him? Well, in my case, I know I would go back and at some point I would say, hey, don't be so upset about that. In five years, you won't even remember it. Trust me. Or I could say, hey, trust me, there's tougher things in life to worry about and cry about than being on stage in the school play. You'll be fine. It's going to be okay. Just remember to enjoy it because I know that you won't. Or, or how about this one? I'll go back and say that test that you're cramming all night for, well, don't. Trust me, it's really not that important. Don't stress that much. Or 10 years later, I would say something similar. That test that you're cramming for, do, absolutely do. And as a matter of fact, you should have started earlier. Maybe I would say that person you're thinking of calling, oh, don't, trust me, don't. That's a bad idea. Or, or maybe that person you're thinking of calling, do. You've taken your time, go ahead and do it. I would say to my 1980s self, all those hair products that you're using, trust me, they won't matter in 30 years. Save your money, will you? We'd have some good conversations, I think. I'd give some good advice, but I think the same is true to conversations about faith throughout the years. Friends, we are about to dive into an incredibly difficult section of Scripture. One which I think would be so easy to ignore and choose something else, but we can't because it is part of God's holy work and it's part of our past. After all, it's Father Abraham and those who ignore the past are bound to repeat it. This text is Abraham's most famous and at the same time most baffling. The text raises many, many, many questions and very few answers, if any. Is God the author of such a test? Is that really how God operates? What does this text tell me about the God that we worship, the God that rules this world? What am I supposed to learn from this for my own life? How am I to read such a violent text, especially today in an age of violence? After all, at its core of the narrative is the sacrifice of a child out of religious conviction and for a higher purpose. What is one to do with this? It's not the first time that we've encountered this text. I remember reading it, and I remember vividly reading it at different stages in my life. Always, always has been problematic today more than ever. And so I thought to myself, maybe the way to tackle it is this. What would happen if I were somehow able to go back in time or to have a conversation with my younger selves about this text at every time in my life when I've encountered it? I imagine myself in a cozy living room sitting down with another three people, myself at 10 years old, myself at 27, myself at 33, and obviously today. We would sit in this living room sipping coffee, except for the 10-year-old, of course, he'd have a Coke, and we'd talk about how each of us sees this text. Knowing me, we'd probably open our Bibles, different Bibles that I've had throughout these years, and sit down and read the text together. We would read, for example, how Abraham took his only son, Isaac, the one he loved, who happened to be about 11 or 12 years old. And he led him to a high mountain, a place called Moreh, or Moriah, or Mare, or Mere, depending on what translation you're looking at. All of those translations um, say something about God being able to see, God who sees, Jehovah who sees or has a vision. And there, on top of that mountain, Abraham would tie him to a rock. The Hebrew word is he would tie him to the Holocaust and would put on top of him the wood and grab a special, a sacrificial knife in order to kill him. Again, the Hebrew word is very specific, in order to slaughter him. And then, in line with what comes next in Scripture, in the book of Leviticus chapter 1, he is to set that burnt offering on fire until nothing at all is left. Everything is consumed as an act of worship to God. Wow. 
What on earth do you do with that? Well, as we're thinking about this, I look to my right, and the 10-year-old me would have his eyes wide open, unable to sleep for weeks, I bet. His jaw would be hitting the floor, and he would immediately say, Are you kidding me? There's no question. It doesn't matter whether or not his dad would do it. The question is not whether or not they would catch me, and I bet they wouldn't. No way this is happening. I remember reading this text for the first time when I was about 10 years old, thinking this exact same thing. I was in Sunday school in church and I was on the edge of my seat, wondering how on earth this was going to end. And I remember when the Sunday school teacher came to the ending of the story, it was a less than satisfying ending. At the very 11th hour, the Sunday school teacher speaks about a ram being caught by its horns and God providing. And I remember the Sunday school teacher acting very relieved at that very moment that God comes through. Even at the very, very end, I also remember how I was, first of all, terrified, of course. And then in the end, much, much not impressed, really. Any child, I imagine, reading this text would develop trust issues with parents after hearing something like that. Uh, Come on, Greg, we're going. Let's go. Where where are we going? Uh, To the supermarket, really. Are you sure we're going to the supermarket? Promise. What time are we coming back? Once this 10-year-old me would get over the shock, I imagine that then I would have some difficult questions for the older selves. Questions like the one I had back then. Guys, does does God really work like that? Is God really like that? Does God ever ask people to do something this crazy, this scary, this insanely difficult? And would God do that to me? Would sit in silence there for a bit. I wanted to speak up and reassure 10-year-old Greg and tell him about God's love who was there with him when he was born and God is there with him all throughout his life. Even in the scariest moments of life, God would always be there, I would tell him. I would tell him that God loves him more than life itself. I would tell him how precious children are to God. I wanted to say that when bold 27-year-old me spoke up, oh, that guy. After all, at 27, I was just starting seminary, sure of everything related to faith matters. I could preach a sermon on the spot without preparation on any topic. So very sad, really. I remember reading this text in seminary. No longer did I see it from the vantage point of a 10-year-old wondering just how fast I could run. Nor did I see it as a parent or a spouse. Uh, I was still single at the time, didn't have any children. I saw it as someone who was trying to figure out what serving God meant in my life. I read this text again and again. I think I read it only for the second or third time after I was 10 years old. It's the kind of text that you just want to avoid, really. And the thought came to me that, wow, an idealistic thought is the one that came to me. I asked myself upon reading this, would I have Abraham's kind of faith? Would I be willing, would I be able to sacrifice it all for the privilege of serving my God? I was so full of zeal and I would remember Jesus' words from Luke chapter 24 when Jesus says, Whoever comes after me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. A text that speaks about full allegiance to God. And I know that text that this one speaks about priorities, even if it uses the strong word hate. The prayer of my 27-year-old in front of this text would be, Yes, Lord, let me put you first and always first in my life and grant to me to have an Abraham kind of faith. It's a commendable thought. It's a commendable stance on this text, though now after these years I see it also as a superficial view of the text. It goes straight to personal piety, but but it skips all of the difficulties, the mountain of ethical questions in this text. Like, for example, is this temptation or is this divine testing? Is this how God acts today? Does God put someone's life in the balance in order just to teach a lesson? Does God ever ask for something Uh, 
which defies logical explanation am I called to follow blindly and immediately every time? How do I discern if this is God or this is just my own thinking? My 27-year-old seems way too sure of his faith, embarrassingly secure of his convictions. And there we are in that living room, sipping coffee. I wanted to tell him that, to poke holes into his faith, but my 33-year-old beat me to the punch. He is sitting there cradling our oldest in my arms. She was just born. And I remember that day encountering this text again. A 33-year-old, I was preparing for a sermon. And trust me, I was very, very tempted to skip this, skip this passage and not use it. I remember as a new parent reading this verse, Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and offer him as a burnt offering, to which I would immediately answer, ha, are you kidding me? That's definitely not going to happen. The author of Genesis goes out of his way with a crescendo of adjectives, uh, and they don't even compare with the way I feel today about my own children. Your son, your only son, your precious son, the one whom you love, that falls way short. And reading about God asking Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, Oh, the certainty of a 27-year-old melted and disappeared at the age of 33. And it made me ask, in preparation for that sermon, a lot of unsettling questions. What kind of God do I serve? What kind of God do we worship? What kind of God would ever ask something like that? How do you reconcile that text in Genesis with the words of Jesus who says, Let the little children come to me, for theirs is the kingdom of God. I hear Jesus say, If anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for him if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they would be thrown into the sea. How can I reconcile God's love for the little ones to a God who would test Abraham in such a way? I remember in preparation for that one sermon where I was looking for an answer, I was begging for an answer, I was actually torturing the text for an explanation which never came. I did find a few interesting good scholarly positions though. Someone wrote about an allegorical interpretation of this text saying that it was included later as a redactor because of the way that it is written, and it is an allegorical story which the church used later on. Coincidentally, it prefigures the Christ of the Gospels. Listen to some of the words. It is the only Son, the Beloved One, to be given as a sacrifice. A miracle which takes place early in the morning on that third day. The son is to, uh, is to take the place of a sacrificial lamb and little Isaac is led up to the mountain to be sacrificed and he is made to carry the cross or the wood placed on his shoulders, not unlike the Via Dolorosa. I read that and I went, ah, I'm not sure it preaches, maybe, but I did not include that in the sermon. That was never the intent of the text. I came an old, across an old song called Jehovah Jireh. Oh, it's bad, trust me. It plays on the response in Hebrew from Abraham to his son Isaac, when Isaac says, Dad, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham replies, Jehovah Yireh, not Jireh, Yireh, which means the Lord will provide. It's an awful song. It says, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me. It's a terrible use of the Hebrew language, completely misses the point. And then I came across Soren Kierkegaard. You might have heard of him. A Danish philosopher in his famous work, Fear and Trembling, speaks of this passage. Finally, a fresh relatable though very difficult to hear and very challenging treatment of the text. In Fear and Trembling, Kierkegaard's view is of an Abraham who says to Isaac as father and son climb up the mountain. He says, oh you foolish boy, do you think I am your father? No, I am an idolater. You think this is God's command? No, this is my desire. Let's do this. <laughs> 
And at that very moment, Isaac, in desperation, for the first time in his life, cries out to God for help. And a broken Abraham says to himself softly, Lord in heaven, I thank you. It is better that he believes me a monster than he would lose faith in you. Wow. I'm not sure that's it. But at least that one feels and smells a lot more human. Instead of the Marvel comic Abraham superhuman superhero who unquestionably climbs up ready to do the unthinkable. Interesting that Abraham questions God's call in chapter 12, but never in chapter 22. In the end, I think I went with a source that said that child sacrifice was very common in Middle Eastern cultures at the time. That God's request of Abraham, and it is a request, by the way, God uses the prefix na in Hebrew, which is translated as please or I beg of you. This is what God says. That, God, you, that God's request to Abraham is actually normal back then. It's to prove a point and to send a very clear message that sa- child sacrifice, so prevalent in many other religions, is not to be practiced by God's followers. That this new religion is one of love in which every child is seen as precious in the eyes of God. Well, it works. It preaches. It has some decent scholarly backing to it, but it also leaves me wanting. It leaves me feeling like we're tap dancing, holy tap dancing, and defending God. I, I didn't love it, by the way. I don't remember how my 30-year-old, 33-year-old preached this text as I carried my newborn in my arms trying to make sense of it all. That imaginary visit with my other three selves was interesting, to say the least. The same text seen through the eyes of different generations. Not wrong, by the way. None of them wrong. None of them right either. Our faith is one that reforms and is ever being changed, ever reforming. I guess that's why they call it the living word. But then after they spoke, it was my turn to speak. And I told them that I simply couldn't get past the violence in this text. It is a very violent text. Take your son kill him as an act of worship. Really? Why is it, I ask my bold 27-year-old self, why is it that if we read this in the Bible, we are quick to say this is a great example of faith, but if we read it in the front page of the Philadelphia Inquirer, we would see headlines like attempted murder, domestic violence, and religious fanatism. And we would have no problem buying into any of those labels. Now, this text is weird. It calls for some serious violence, which is hard to ignore. If we were to hear those words from anyone today, someone who says, God spoke to me and told me to lift up a knife, and then, well, we wouldn't hesitate to call 911 and even a few mental health professionals. Who told you? And we wouldn't be the first ones, by the way, to have these problems with this text at all. Scholars, as early as the second century, have tried to reconcile this with the God of love that we love and worship. A few of them, even wondering back then if Abraham really heard from God or was guided by his own imagination. I I don't know. I do know, however, that it's God's holy word. And I do know, as we say every Sunday, that it's God's holy word spoken for me today. I also know, however, that it is impossible for us to ignore this violence in the text. And that is a good thing. I know that my 27-year-old would say, yeah, Greg, but take a look at the ram God is providing. And I would say, hold on a second, take a look at Isaac and the look of horror on his face. There is violence in this text. It's hard to ignore, and that is good. That is a good thing. I pray that these days we are at least a little bit more sensitive to any act of violence or even threat of the same in this world, especially these days. I am reminded of a sermon that Caroline preached a couple of weeks ago about Hagar and Ishmael. How Isaac on the altar is an extension of Ishmael in the wilderness. How Sarah's get rid of Ishmael is replaced by get rid of Isaac. This is a violent text. And in my opinion, no one gets it. No one who gets it actually likes it. It is so problematic. I imagine that, I don't know, Dr. Phil 
If he were to rise up, write a verse 14 and a half, it would probably read the following. They came down the mountain. Isaac never spoke to his father again, and Sarah moved out that very night. I know it sounds weird, but it's not too far-fetched. Keep reading in chapter 22 and following because we never hear of Abraham and Isaac speaking again after this incident. You don't hear them together ever again until Abraham's death later on in chapter 25. Not only that, we hear that Sarah is living somewhere else in a chapter or two. And not only that, we never read about Abraham ever speaking to God again in Scripture. It's a strange text. It's a text that ends well, but it really doesn't. I don't know. I may feel differently in 15 years. Actually, I'm sure I will feel differently in 15 years. But today, today, this text makes me think that sometimes, sometimes in Scripture and in life, God works through us. But most of the time, God works in spite of us. And that, friends, is very good news. This text tells me this morning that God is greater than any of our strange acts of violence in this world. This text tells me that God is greater than any of the strangeness and the wrong in my life. It tells me that God can still use me and work through me and work through you to minister to this world in spite of the sin in our lives, in spite of who we are. It tells me that while I may be innocent and zealous in praising God for the ram, I cannot ignore Isaac's look of terror and be grateful that God put a stop to it. And maybe, as I said, maybe that is good news, the good news we need to hear today. That however it is that you read this text, that you may know that God is still able to work and is working in this world in spite of us even in the midst of violence and pain and suffering and aggressions and sometimes the worst that humanity has to offer, God is able to work and provide and bring about God's kingdom. And in that promise, we rest secure this morning. May this be so in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.